and educating future generations of cardiologists in critical, tra critical care training pathways, as well as enhancing CCM fellow training in cardiovascular disease. He is an assistant professor of medicine at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, as well as medical director of the CICU at the Texas Heart Institute at Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. Today, um, he will be presenting to us on the congestion cascade, harnessing the power of Doppler. Dr. Sunusi, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Can you hear me and does everyone see my slides? All right, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. For me, it was a uh, very easy you know, decision to, to do this because for many of you, you might not know, but I actually spent my formative years in Birmingham, Alabama. So it occupies a very, very important piece in my heart. So uh, with that, I'd say this, you know, I did a cardiovascular fellowship after doing critical care medicine, but I was humbled throughout the years when I started to realize that you can actually learn more about the heart and its function and IE dysfunction by actually looking at the organs that it supplies. So today we're gonna to talk about some very simple topics. We're going to uh, go over venous return and these concepts of fluid responsiveness. Uh, we will talk very, very briefly about traditional methods of assessing volume status and how they can be very flawed. Um, the bulk of this is going to be talking about congestion parameters, especially the newer ones that you may not be familiar with, uh, lung ultrasonography, portal and hepatic vein Doppler, and finally intrarenal venous Doppler. We'll talk about some illustrative case examples where you can incorporate the power of Doppler to understand vascular congestion and hopefully uh, institute appropriate therapies for your patient. Mm -hmm. Finally, we'll discuss a little bit about the future directions of, of using Doppler in these critically ill patients. So I'll start off with the cardiovascular system. I like to partition the cardiovascular system into two main parts. We have the cardiac output side that we know very well. We maintain mean arterial pressures to a certain degree. We understand perfusion well. We understand lactate, lactate kinetics to some point. Um, but this part is all about oxygen delivery to the tissues. And we do this well, and it's pretty simple and straightforward. However, when we look at the venous return side, uh, this is like the dark side of the moon. We have forgotten physiology, we've forgotten Guytonian physiology, and we for forget the principles that govern this side of the cardiovas cardiovascular system. So when it comes to forward flow, we always have to remember whether we're talking any kind of flow, we're talking about an upstream and a low stream pressure. So for example, in a patient who has a MAP in the 70s with a right atrial pressure between zero to five, you're always going to have that gradient from the upstream pressure down to the downstream pressure. Well, how about the venous side? What determines the flow from these post capillary venules that you see here into the capacitance vessels back into the right side of the heart? Obviously we have valves in the veins and we have the calf muscles that contract, but there's also a gradient here. And this can be measured experimentally, and it's known as the mean systemic filling pressure. And when measured experimentally, we find it around 8 to 10 millimeters of mercury. Now, you can clearly see that there is a delicate balance between the right atrial pressure and this mean systemic filling pressure. So much so that if you um, artificially or iatrogenically start to increase this patient's central venous pressure by giving indiscriminate volume, what you'll notice is that the right atrial pressure starts to rise. Now, although your mean systemic filling pressure will rise as well, it will not do so at the same magnitude of your right atrial pressure. Therefore, you set yourself up where you have a high right atrial pressure or central venous pressure and a lower mean systemic filling pressure, thus destroying that gradient that you normally have. And how does that manifest? Well, it manifests in the form of venous back pressure or venous congestion. And that venous congestion manifests clinic clinically into what? more congestion in encapsulated organs such as the liver, such as the kidney, and gross congestion of the Slanknik circulation. And this is what the talk is really going to be focusing on. How can I accurately measure or at least quantify vascular congestion in these organs? Now, before we do that, I really need to touch on several topics. And the first is this concept of volume or fluid responsiveness. We all know that volume responsiveness is an increase in the stroke volume by greater than 15 to 20% when giving a standardized bolus or a passive leg raise. Now, 
what we do normally in clinical medicine over the last few years is that we continue to give fluids to patients until they reach a point of being no longer fluid responsive. And we do that because we want to increase the stroke volume in hopes of increasing the mean arterial pressure. However, over time, we've realized the more fluid you give to a patient who is beyond that point of fluid responsiveness, the more it contributes to increasing that mean systemic filling, sorry, the right atrial pressure, the central venous pressure, and the more it actually contributes to venous congestion or venous excess. All right. And we've really started over the time. So this is just an illustra illustration of how we normally do things. If this is your cardiac output or your stroke volume, as you give a 500 cc bolus, you'll see that the patient had an increase in the stroke volume, thus increasing the cardiac output. Once you've given that additional 500 cc bolus, your patient is no longer volume responsive because there's no increase in the stroke volume. And thus all this fluid contributes to nothing more than congestion that leads to worsening organ dysfunction as well as poorer outcomes. We've started to realize over time that we should not be targeting fluid responsiveness or that point where we reach where the patient is no longer fluid responsive because it takes us into a very dangerous territory. It takes us in a place here at the flatter part of the Starling curve where a fluid bolus leads to very little increase in stroke volume, but it increases significantly your extravascular lung water and the congestion in the organs that we talked about. So just to understand a historical perspective, over the years, um, early 2000, early goal-directed therapy uh, uh, was, was something that we did uh, in 2001, uh, in, in, in a hospital in Michigan, we all know about the story where we started giving large amounts of fluids for patients who have sepsis. Um, this led to a almost a decade of overjudicious use of fluid resuscitation. And we started to realize over time that this led to multi-organ dysfunction and poor outcomes. Now we've been more aware of the dangers of indiscriminate volume loading. We've start, started to use things like non-invasive cardiac output monitoring or limiting the amount of fluid that we give patients. However, during these different time periods, we've always tried to look for a better means of assessing the, fluid, the patient's fluid status. So we know in general that the dangers of volume overload apply to all comers in the ICU. We know that it causes organ dysfunction without a doubt, and we understand that it causes poor outcomes. And that being said, we need to have a more elegant way of finding out whether or not this patient needs more fluid or needs to be de-resuscitated and have volume removed. So this is the old trusty swan Gans catheter, uh, really has been uh, slandered in the literature. There's multitude of studies that showed no benefit Unfortunately, we all know this is in a mixed ICU population. We understand the problems of the inherent problems of the study design and concepts like heterogeneity of treatment effect. There are some patients who will benefit, there are some who will not. And at the same time, a lot of people don't realize that the technical aspects of using this flotation device are very important. If you're not taking good measurements and you're making bad decisions according to certain me measurements, then you will have bad outcomes. Which brings us to the IVC. And this is something that over the last decade had taken over and unfortunately I think is misinterpreted most of the time. And I'll say this, the IVC should never ever be equated to volume status. And one of my biggest pet peeves is seeing a patient um, and then one of my trainees is scanning the patient and they tell me that the IVC is large and thus the patient is hypervolemic. And this is where there's a disconnect in understanding what the IVC is really showing us. This is the same patient. Um, the only difference here is that the patient was placed on positive pressure. You can clearly see a very plump IVC on the right when the patient's on positive pressure and a completely collapsible IVC on the left. Um, this is not a representation of the patient's what? Volume status. Instead, it actually represents the patient's right-sided filling pressures. Another example I always give to everyone is, well, if I suddenly develop obstructive shock from a saddle pulmonary embolism, I would expect my right-sided filling pressures to increase. And if my right-sided filling pressures are to increase, you will notice that your IVC is going to get plump. But the only reason the IVC is plump is not because there's been an increase in your volume, there's actually a congestion point. That is, i.e. at the 
for a branch point of the pulmonary artery. That is an obstructive point, and therefore there's more compartmentalization of the fluid. The, uh, the, uh, the answer to this question is not to give this patient diuretics, but to treat the PE itself. So why did the IVC fail? Well, it failed because we thought it told us something that it didn't. The IVC is nothing more than a barometer to the right side of the heart. It should not be equated to volume status. Remember, we have collapsible IVCs and we are volume responsive. That is our natural physiological state. If we suddenly get infected uh, with some infection, um, your volume status is the same. The only difference is mainly a vasodilatory response. We have this overwhelming need to do something. And so we tend to fluid resuscitate patients, which causes more and more harm. So that being said, we need to come up with better answers. Now, over the last five years or so, you'll see, especially if you are familiar with social media, you'll see a big, big following when it comes to using simplified vex, uh, venous excess scores like the VEXIS score that takes into account several different uh, Doppler uh, waveform patterns. So for example, when looking at the IVC, the hepatic vein, the portal vein, and potentially the intrarenal venous Doppler. Uh, my issue with a simplified clinical scoring system like this is that it really doesn't paint the big picture. The last thing you want to do is lump up all these different vascular parameters and try to create a scoring system to tell you whether you're going to diurese the patient or not. This is why I think it's very, very important to take a step back and to truly understand the physiology behind this. Because for example, the hepatic veins gives you an incredible amount of information about the right side of the heart and cannot be oversimplified into a scoring system. And so many of you who employ point of care ultrasound on your, in your day-to-day -day teaching or day-to-day -day clinical practice, um, we'll start to think, well, maybe this is a little too complex for me. And I don't think that it, it is. It is under the realm of advanced hemodynamics, but I think that it's very easy to acquire these Doppler waveforms. And with time, it's very easy to then uh, interpret these waveforms. So we'll start with lung ultrasound that I'm going to go very briefly over. We understand the concepts of the two different artifacts that we're looking for and how a well aerated lung will have horizontal reverberation artifacts. Maybe that's and one, one, yeah. And then one that is full of whatever fluid, non or cardiogenic pulmonary edema will start to develop those vertical reverberations. We know this well, we understand how to pick up these different artifacts. And for the most part, I think most intensivists use lung ultrasound. All right, this is an example of someone who has scattered beelines. Another example of someone with scattered beelines everywhere in their anterior lung field. And lastly, you can see very clearly the beelines here with the curvilinear probe. Now, with this lung ultrasound, this is how we've been using it for years. We start to, in our minds, create a differential diagnosis depending on these uh, A or B line patterns. And depending on the profile or pattern that we see, we can then start developing a short list for differential diagnosis. For example, unilateral B lines usually uh, indicate pneumonia or in the very rare case where you have a centric MR leading to unilateral pulmonary edema. Beeline profile, on the other hand, is more consistent with cardiogenic pulmonary edema or someone who has non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Now, you can go into the weeds about looking at the pleural line and trying to distinguish, looking at gap lesions, thickening of the pleural line, and stuff like the distances between the beelines to try to distinguish non-cardiogenic from cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Uh, my issues with that is I find that clinically it's not as helpful and the data doesn't support it either. So when we when lung ultrasound you know came uh, to the field, it was very clear a lot of people adopted it, but was it the answer we were all waiting for? And I would have to say a resounding no. And the reason is for exa is exactly what I mentioned previously is that, Patients who have bilateral beeline profiles, we're really not sure why. We don't know it's because of congestion on the left side of the heart, or is it some inflammatory process in the lung itself? And this is why I always show this oh, image. Shoot. So let's say, for example, you have a patient here who has completely normal hemodynamics, has no hemodynamic congestion. You will not see any mm -hmm. beelines in their lung field. However, as the patient's hemodynamics as their left-sided filling pressures start to rise, 
you will not instantly start to develop B lines. You will only start to develop B lines when the fluid extrudes into the alveoli and therefore you start to see the B line. So you can have someone who has high left-sided filling pressures who still does not exhibit a B line pattern. Therefore, some non-invasive means of assessing left-sided filling pressure is essential when you're interpreting lung ultrasound. And a good example I give is someone who has, for example, who's diagnosed with ARDS. Um, you go and you do a full exam on the patient and you realize that they actually have torrential MR. And the MRs is what leading to the pseudo ARDS picture. I've seen it so many times before, but you will not be able to pick it up if you don't understand the differences between lung ultrasound manifesting, meaning seeing the B lines, and then the left-sided filling pressures or hemodynamic congestion. So that brings us to our next congestion parameter, congestion point. And the portal vein is an amazing vascular structure because it drains the gastric, the splenic, and the mesenteric veins. The portal vein in itself gives us an incredible uh, idea about the splenic circulation. Now, this is an example of a portal vein. It is very easy to obtain these views. In order to acquire these views, you just need a modified transhepatic view, similar to when you're looking for pleural effusions on the right side. Now, you can clearly see that the portal vein drains in the direction of the liver. That's why it looks red here. This is known as hepatopetal flow. It goes from, from the feet all the way to the liver. And so it's red. It's important to realize the characteristics of this flow. Uh, portal vein flow is monophasic. It's like a venous hum, like a waterfall. There's no pulsatility or phasicity to it whatsoever. This is healthy portal vein flow. Know it and know it well. When you look here, this is someone who, uh, for example, overnight receives a little bit more fluid than they should have. Instead of having that flat um, monophasic portal vein flow, you can clearly start to see a little bit of pulsatility de to developing. This is still within the confines of normal, but we know we're headed towards more pulsatile flow, which is pathological. And this is someone who clearly has pulsatile flow within the portal vein. Um, again, so that monophasic flow is now replaced with these peaks and troughs, um, at, in, you know, in the literature, you can also measure pulsatility index. I just find it more important for you to detect these waveform patterns with your eyes. You don't necessarily have to measure it. And you know things are really bad when you start to see that blush of blue on the portal vein. Why? Because the portal vein should always flow in the direction of the liver. When it has retrograde flow, it turns blue. That means it's going away from the liver, and that's bad. That's because your pulsatile flow is not only pulsatile, but it's also biphasic. It actually goes retrograde in the wrong direction. So you can imagine how your splenic circulation looks like in patients who have these very critical pulsatile retrograde biphasic flows. Here's a patient that we saw very clearly started to develop some pulsatility in the uh, portal vein. This patient was on low dose pressors. We decided to diurese the patient. Um, after diuresing the patient, the patient came off of pressors and we normalized this portal vein flow. So we're moving away from just uh, static numbers of central venous pressure. We're looking at physiology. We're understanding uh, uh, physiological waveforms. And now we're trying to get go back to normal waveforms in these patients. So that's the portal vein. The intrarenal venous Doppler is very similar. Remember, we're focusing on the venous side. Um, here, you can also get that similar view from going through a transhepatic view. And that view, you'll see a, uh, a, a collection of different flows, arterial and venous. And you really want it at the edge of that cortex and medulla. And what you'll get is a mixed flow pattern. You'll have the arterial on top and you'll have the venous on the bottom. The venous is the most important thing we're looking at here. And you can clearly see, even though there's a little bit of pulsatility here on the, cis, uh, on the S wave, which is systole and diastole, for the most part, what your eye needs to look for is continuous flow. As long as there's continuous flow in these intrarenal venous Dopplers, you know that there's healthy flow.
Once you start to develop pulsatility, for example, the S and the D wave, this is known as discontinuous flow or interrupted flow. Now you know that the congestion in the kidneys is getting worse. Ultimately, when you see very interrupted or discontinuous flow, then you know this patient it has renosarco or very edematous kidneys. The reason for this is actually flow reversal of that S wave that now blends into that arterial waveform. So remember, the, the spectrum is continuous, interrupted, interrupted with just monophasic flow. Here are some examples of these patients. For example, here, completely normal monophasic flow with very little pulsatility. This is normal. Here's someone who's gotten too much fluid. You can start to see discontinuous flow, S and D waves. And then finally, someone who's reached a peak here is when you've got given too much fluid and now you have systolic flow reversal, but also interrupted flow with just monophasic waveforms. Again, the spectrum, monophasic, discontinuous, discontinuous monophasic waveforms. This is the worst. This patient needs emergent volume removal in some way, shape, or form. Next comes the hepatic vein Dopplers. This is by far my favorite uh, 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 Doppler waveform. The reason is it's, it's a, it gives you a back seat to the right side of the heart. And it allows you to investigate not only volume status, but also what I call the right heart apparatus. And the right heart apparatus is the atria, the right atrium, the tricuspid valve, RV, as well as pulmonary pressures. And some, anything that happens along that right heart apparatus may show you changes in the hepatic vein. So the more you do this, the more you'll be able to pick it up. Now it's important to understand that this hepatic waveform is very similar to your jugular venous waveform. The only difference is the nomenclature. So when you draw a line here, this is the anti-grade A wave. This is the, sorry, the retrograde A wave. This is the anti-grade S wave and the anti-grade D wave. Remember that you have it crossing the baseline maybe once or even twice, but the most important thing is that it's tetra-inflectional. You have an A wave, S wave, transitional V wave, and a transitional D wave, and we'll talk about each and every component. In order to do so, we have to link electrical and mechanical concepts together. When you have a P wave, this is what activates atrial contraction. When the atria contract, remember, you're looking at the atria from the hepatic veins. That's the back seat. And so when the atria contracts, it causes retrograde flow back into the hepatic veins. And this is what this A wave is. Um, the, uh, tri so when the uh, R wave, when we reach the R wave, the peak of the R wave is systole. And when we talk about systole, we're talking about the RV. And the RV actually pulls the tricuspid valve downwards. And as it pulls the tricuspid valve downwards, what happens is that the atria expands, its volume gets bigger. And this provides almost like a suction event. So now that blood that was pushed back into the hepatic veins comes rushing in. And what does it manifest here? You can clearly see that you will have an anti-grade waveform that is filling the atria. And this is known as the S wave. It's called S wave because it occurs dur during systole. And the S wave, as the uh, blood fills up the atria, it starts to build up pressure until a point where it goes up above the baseline. And that's called the transitional V wave. Once the pressures in the atria overcome the pressure in the ventricle, that's when the tricuspid valve opens. And when the tricuspid valve opens, because of that pressure gradient, uh, blood will flow from the right atrium into the right ventricle, leading to diastolic flow. So therefore, we have A, which represents retrograde flow during contraction of the atria. S is uh, anti-grade flow during systole. D is uh, anti-grade flow during diastole. It's very easy to get these images. I prefer a transhepatic view uh, on C, uh, and you can clearly see the hepatic veins. You put color flow Doppler, and then you place your pulse wave on that hepatic vein, and then you reproduce those uh, Doppler patterns. Okay, now the hepatic veins, we're gonna spend some time on the hepatic veins because they are, um, again, they tell you more information about hemodynamics than the simplified intrarenal venous Dopplers or the simplified portal veins.
Here, for example, in a patient who is breathing normally, because you have an increase in venous return during inspiration, your anti-grade waveforms, meaning your S waves and your D waves become larger. The same patient can take a deep breath out and you'll notice that the retrograde waveforms become larger and your anti-grade waveforms become smaller. This is the same patient with changes, physiological changes in their hepatic veins, but you would not have known that if you don't understand what happens during breathing. And here's an example. Take a look at the uh, EKG strip here. This is how you have to orient yourself every single time. Go to the R wave. The R wave is the peak of systole. Anything that occurs after the R wave represents the S wave. And clearly you can see during inspiration this massive S wave. And as the patient breathes out, the S wave and the D wave become smaller. As they breathe in, it becomes larger. This is within the confines of normal. Same here, patient was asked to make it very deep breath and within two, three cardiac cycles, you can see an increase in the anti-grade flow. Here's an example of someone breathing out and look at that reversal wave that we normally don't see and that diastolic reversal wave. That's all because of changes in inspiration and expiration. And this has nothing to do with pathology. This is what happens when you breathe in and out. Number two, it's very important. Uh, we always talk about AV synchrony in cardiology. The atrium need to be synchronized with the ventricles. It's very important to have a good atrium. In this example here, you have someone who has a very strong atrial contraction. Because of that strong atrial contraction, good compliance, the atria also relaxes. And when it relaxes, it takes down the pressure all the way down here to this little hump that you see that we call the C wave. Now, when the patient contracts, that flow is augmented because of the relaxation of the atria. Now, suddenly you have a very large forward flow, good forward flow into the right ventricle. Um, as if you lose this atrial wave or you have a non-compliant atrium that's seen in older patients or patients who have atriopathy, what you'll notice is that the S wave becomes smaller. Here's the example. Here's the QRS complex. So the S wave must be the one right afterwards. You have good retrograde A wave that relaxes all the way down here. And then you have augmented flow. Very important. Other changes that you can see depend on the heart rate. If a patient has a very slow heart rate, you can start to see the S and the D wave very well. If they have very fast heart rates, on the other hand, they may fuse together. So now it's very important to start to break up the different components of the hepatic vein Doppler waveform. Looking at the A wave will tell me a lot of information about, again, the tricuspid wave, atrial dysrhythmias, RV function, as well as PA pressures. And the atrial reversal wave can either be completely absent, it could be prominent all the time, it could be prominent sometimes, or it could be completely biphasic. And we'll go through this. Whenever you have a loss of at organized atrial activity or atrial dysrhythmia, you will notice that you will lose your A wave, okay? So what happens when you lose your A wave? This is a patient who has atrial fibrillation. You don't have an A wave and therefore you don't have relaxation. If you don't have relaxation of the atria, you will not have a large S wave. And so for patients who have atrial fibrillation, you will notice a blunted S wave. Unfortunately, if you apply the principles of the VEXA scoring system, a blunted S wave tells you that the patients may be a little more volume overloaded. This has nothing to do with volume and all only has to do with AV desynchrony. Here's an example of someone with AFib, small S wave, large D wave, nothing to do with volume. Here's a patient who has atrial fibrillation. You can clearly see the flutter waves here. And then as the patient, and interestingly enough, if the patient's taking a deep breath in, forward flows increase, the flutter waves become larger. And as they breathe out, the flutter waves become smaller. But it's very hard to pick up any retrograde A waves because this patient has flutter waves. Here's another example. Slower rate, you can actually even see it in the baseline EKG, that sawtooth appearance, probably some uh, uh, four to one, three to one conduction. But he, look at he, what's happening here. The A wave, flutter wave, flutter wave. When the flutter wave lands on the QRS complex, 
it causes atrial contraction while the tricuspid valve is closed. And clearly you can see that when the tricuspid valve is closed and the contraction happens, you have a very large anti-grade A wave. So what is prominent atrial reversal waves? So when you have A waves that are large and they are consistently large every cardiac cycle, start thinking about a fixed obstruction or some kind of atrial dysrhythmia that may cause this. Here's an example of a patient who has an AVNRT. It has a, very, a retrograde P wave. What that means is that atrial contraction occurs very close to the QRS complex, and therefore it contracts when the valve is closed. And you can clearly see that the A wave is almost as big as the S or D wave. And so you have almost what looks like a biphasic waveform. Again, this is not volume status. This is basically someone who has large A waves because of an AVNRT. Here's a clinical entity that's not very common. And this is number two, the tricuspid valve. You can see large giant A waves because of a fixed obstruction of the tricuspid valve. This is due to tricuspid stenosis. Now, the A waves can become prominent like we talked about intermittently whenever the P wave falls on the QRS complex. But also interestingly enough, for example, if you have heart block, Whenever that A wave, whenever the P wave falls on the QRS complex, you can suddenly see a large A wave. This is indicative of AV dissociation. Also, if you have a PVC that lands around the QRS complex, you can also start to detect these A waves. So remember, these A waves are large, but they're not large every single QRS complex. Lastly, this is something I find very interesting. When you have someone has poor RV compliance, high PA pressures, sometimes um, the only way to manifest abnormalities in the hepatic vein is to ask the patient to take a deep breath in. As they take a deep breath in, the venous return increases. Therefore, then you unmask this what obstruction in the right side of the heart. And you start to see a large A wave only when you breathe in. Of course, if you have very severe RV dysfunction and PA pressures, you can probably see uh, uh, a, a reversal in every single cardiac cycle. But this is only manifested when patients take a deep breath in. So now we start to understand just that little A wave can give us an incredible amount of information. It can be completely absent in AFib or atrial flutter. In a patient who has liver disease, who has non-compliant vessels, that A wave does not even uh, resonate back into the hepatic vein, so you just have monophasic flow. Biphasic flow occurs when you have a very slow heart rate. That relaxation of the A wave goes back in here before the S wave is formed. And then we have to understand when we see a large A wave, is it a large, is it prominent all the time? So think about contraction against the tricuspid valve, tricuspid stenosis, and RV compliance issues. Or does it happen intermittently, like with the PVC, heart block, atrial flutter, or expiratory or inspiratory increases in RV compliance? Now, what comes next is the S wave. And this is, I think, what we're mostly familiar with. The S wave occurs during systole. If you look at the bottom of the screen, normal S wave pattern is the S is larger than the D wave. Um, and um, this tells you that there's probably normal hepatic flow. As the patient's volume status worsens and the patient develops more congestion, you start to see blunting of the S wave. But remember the caveat is like we looked at the atrial dysrhythmias that may not necessarily be due to volume or congestion. After time, if you continue to overload the patient, you can see that the S wave may disappear and ultimately the S wave may flip. This is known as systolic flow reversal. This here may indicate very poor functioning of your right heart apparatus or volume congestion. So the S wave I think is the most important that you have to look at. Remember the S wave is, uh, is governed by atrial contraction, the level or degree of tricuspid regurgitation, RV dysfunction and PA pressures and generally volume overload. But we need to break it down. When you have an S wave that's due to tricuspid regurgitation, you have to understand that tricuspid regurgitation volume increases as systole progresses. So you have more volume at the end of systole, which makes sense. It's a regurgitant valve. And so when you have systolic flow reversal, it's usually late systolic flow reversal. S wave, 
late systolic flow reversal, D wave. This is how it looks like, S wave, late systolic flow reversal. And remember, it's because the regurgitant volume increases as systole increases. However, in RV systolic function, meaning there's a problem with your pump, um, you will have early systolic flow reversal, right? Because you can't pump that volume out. And so you start to see early systolic flow reversal. Now, these two clinical entities do not usually occur uh, alone, and they usually occur together. So what happens when you have both tricuspid regurgitation and RV dysfunction? Well, this is what happens. They merge together. The early and the late systolic come together to form pan-systolic or hollow-systolic flow reversal. And this is how it looks like. You can see that the S wave is completely flipped um, and then you only have one wave downwards. Remember, you like to see two waves pointing anti-grade and one wave retrograde. Here you have retrograde, anti-grade, retrograde. So this pattern here, this biphasic waveform is very bad. It indicates that you have a problem with the right side of your heart and you may be volume overloaded. This is a very severe form. You can clearly see biphasic waveforms and we have lost that natural physiological S and D wave. Your patient is in a lot of trouble here probably needs volume removal and a better assessment of the right side of the heart. So again, the S wave, we can start to understand. The S wave can be small because of problems of the right side of the heart, or it could be because of volume congestion, but also when you lose your atrial kick. Um, and then reversal is either early because of systole or late because of regurgitant valve and that is during tricuspid regurg regurgitation, you'll have a late systolic flow reversal, or if you have a combination of both, you'll have pan-systolic flow reversal. Now, I'm not gonna go in detail with this, but also looking at the D-wave gives you an incredible amount of information about constriction. Again, uh, diastolic flow reversal during expiration in patients who have constrictive pericarditis, and in restrictive cardiomyopathy, it is during inspiration, you have the diastolic flow reversal. Okay. Um, so, bonus, if you understand hepatic veins, you understand pulmonary veins. If you do transesophageal echo and in some views with transthoracic and apical four chamber, you can catch your pulmonary veins. In a patient who has a TEE, you can see that the reversal wave is just the opposite direction. You have an S wave and you have a D wave. So the same principles apply. In a patient who has blunted S wave can be volume overloaded, has worsening MR. And when the flow is reversed, you're looking at severe MR. Again, just applying simple principles of Doppler to another vascular structure. And here's an example of someone who has really severe MR who has systolic flow reversal. Okay, so now we're starting to understand there's a paradigm shift in understanding volume status. We no longer look at static numbers and the dynamic things we've been looking at like fluid responsiveness may not be as helpful as we think they are. And instead we're starting to look at this whole body approach, harnessing Doppler and looking at this spectrum of patients who develop congestion across different vascular beds. With that being said, let's look at some illustrative case examples where we can apply this. So here's someone who has a, a cabbage, this is post-cabbage, post-operative day one, has respiratory failure. We've been told to diurese this patient. If you can see the imaging here, this is the kind of imaging you're going to get post-op. It is a uh, sub-xiphoid view, but you can clearly see good movement of that tricuspid annulus, and you can clearly see that we probably have preserved biventricular function. So there's nothing wrong with the heart. If you're looking at the IVC, this patient is spontaneously breathing, you can clearly see a collapsible IVC. But again, like I said, this is not indicative of the patient's volume status. Um, we are all have collapsible IVCs. And so I would be wary about interpreting this. I need some additional information. So here is, again, something took out from the patient. Clearly you can see the hepatic veins are blue. If they're blue, that means they're moving towards the IVC. You can never see a flash of red. So there's no retrograde flow. So just looking at the color Doppler, I can tell you the hepatic vein flow is anti-grade. This is not the best images, but you can see predominantly most of the flow is occurring anti-grade. As a further adjunct, we looked at the portal veins and the portal veins are completely flat. 
So we did not diurese this patient. Instead, I did a lung ultrasound and I found patchy bee lines. This patient aspirated shortly after extubation. And this was the reason why the patient had respiratory failure and then was supported with non-invasive positive pressure ventilation and did well. Next patient, this is a 57 year old woman. She has COVID-19 pneumonia, severe refractory hypoxemia, sedated, intubated, paralyzed, prone, and on inhaled pulmonary vasodilators. She now develops by day five or six, worsening AKI and hypotension. Here is her lung ultrasound. Is it helpful? Not really. All her lungs have bee lines everywhere. I don't know if it's cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic. If I look at her heart, you can clearly see a hyperdynamic LV, and the RV looks all right, but again, a preserved biventricular function, not really helpful in terms of what I need to do right now. When I took a look at the hepatic veins, very clearly, what do you see here? You've lost those, that physiological waveform. No longer do you have anti-grade S and D wave, you have biphasic waveforms. This patient is very volume overloaded. I look at the portal vein as well, and the portal vein shows extreme pulsatility. So this patient is volume overloaded. And despite the fact that they're on a moderate dose of vasopressors and vasoactive agents, the next step was to remove volume. And as you removed almost 10 liters of volume over the course of two to three days, you can clearly see that this patient's waveforms went from a biphasic unphysiological waveform into the normal SND pattern that we're used to. And as we remove fluid, a patient hemodynamically became better and was weaned off all vasoactive agents. Next is a 28-year-old man with tricuspid valve endocarditis. He has worsening respiratory failure, worsening shock, and acute kidney injury. We're told to diurese the patient. This is the patient's lung ultrasound, has bilateral B lines, which could either be due to edema, pulmonary edema, cardiogenic type, or it could be due to the tricuspid valve showering these emboli, so septic emboli in the lung. I don't know. If you look at the echo, you can see the RV's function is fine, but you see what the technical term for this thing here is a Goomba just sitting there on the tricuspid valve. I haven't shown the color flow, but you can clearly see torrential tricuspid regurgitation. So severe TR in this patient who we're being told has AKI, is volume overloaded and needs to be diuresed. So what's the next step? Well, I took a look at their hepatic veins. This is the S wave. This is the, this here is the S wave. Sorry, this is the anti-grade A wave here. This is the S wave and look at what you've got here. You've got a late, systolic flow reversal. What is late systolic flow reversal? That means near the end of systole, you have more and more volume. That tells me there's a regurgitant valve there. And we already know the patient has severe tricuspid regurgitation. The hepatic veins here, if you applied the VEXA score, would tell you that this was abnormal and the patient's volume was up. But this is only because you have severe TR and you can still have severe TR and be volume down. So what do I need? I need the deal breaker here. And that is the portal vein. And the portal vein here, although there's a little bit of pulsatility, it is not very uh, stark. You don't have a high pulsatility index. And so instead of giving this patient diuresis, I started giving this patient volume. And what happened was that the patient's AKI improved, the patient was approved for surgery, went for emergent surgery, and did well thereafter. We could have easily diuresed this patient to AKI oblivion. Next is a 60 year old man with AKI, respiratory failure, and we were told from an outside hospital has significantly elevated in diastolic pressures during a cath. BMP was over 1000 in the setting of AKI. I pulled this actually from the patient's chart. Um, I record whenever I uh, uh, assess any patient with undifferentiated shock or with respiratory failure, I do this systematic approach. You can clearly see as the patient is breathing in, you have very good anti-grade flow. So the hepatic veins show good flow. The portal vein also has flat monophasic flow. I do not believe this patient has an elevated in diastolic pressure. We went ahead to confirm, we did a swan at the bedside and it was very clear if you can see the numbers here, the capillary wedge was only in the single digits and obviously the PA pressures were not elevated, but we were able to glean this by just using a non-invasive method of actually measuring, uh, actually looking at Doppler waveforms. So this brings me to what I call the congestion cascade. 
after you've ruled out obstructive shock, whether it's a tamponade or tension pneumo or PE, et cetera, it's very important for you to have a systematic approach. And I've always looked at the cardiovascular system as simple plumbing. Um, and the way I look at it are valves, pipes, and pumps. And I work my way from the aortic valve, which is the garden hose of this cardiovascular system, looking for very important diagnoses that can change management, i.e. severe AS or severe AI. I look at the LVOT to make sure that there's no LV, dynamic LVOT obstruction. We all examine the LV for diastolic systolic function. I carefully examine the valve here, the mitral valve. Then I work my way to the lungs, the RVOT Doppler, the right side of the heart, which is the RV and the tricuspid valve. And finally, the IVC and the congestion parameters that we talked about, hepatic vein Doppler, portal vein Doppler, and intrarenal venous Doppler. If you do this a lot, you can do this in 10 to 15 minutes, or you can skip around, but make sure if you start to see venous Doppler, for example, the hepatic vein Doppler and portal vein Doppler actually shows that the patient is congested, start to focus on the IVC and the right side of the heart. You can take key components like the LV, lung, and hepatic, and if you find an abnormality, start to work your way more distally. Now, this is something that I show to all, everyone every time I do this lecture. Um, sometimes we spend 40 minutes uh, with the trainees looking at patients, and then you ask the patient, how do you feel, sir? And he says, sir, I'm as dry as a bone. The reason I bring this up is that, yes, I do advocate people to adopt this, but what's more important is your clinical acumen. You have to interpret this in the context, in the clinical context of the patient. All right. Lastly, I'm going to talk about what the future directions are. Um, here at Baylor St. Luke's, we're actually uh, going, we're actually trying to implement this in more complex hemodynamics like ECMO. So, for example, a patient who is on support, what we do is we'll remove the support when we're doing the ECMO wean and we'll take a look at the hepatic veins. Sometimes, when you remove the support, you can actually unmask congestion, put the patient back on ECMO support, and start to aggressively diurese. And we've been implementing this in our ECMO wean strategies. Also looking at RVOT Doppler, how to optimize LVADs. We look at LVOT Doppler and we go up on pump speeds or go down according, on, according to how these RVOT Doppler waveforms look like. And lastly, very interesting, sometimes it's difficult to interpret these waveforms. We're really looking to validate a novel anti-grade retrograde hepatic Doppler derived parameter. In other words, it measures the area under the curve for anti-grade flow and the area under the curve for retrograde flow. It gives you a ratio and it may be more telling about congestion than what we normally do, as well as very helpful when it comes to patients who have dysrhythmias, et cetera, where this can be automatically calculated. Calculated. With that being said, any questions? Thank you so much for this talk, Murad. Um, if um, somebody in says they can unmute the microphone, that way we can hear if there are any questions. I I have a general question. That was a very, very excellent talk on a pretty difficult concept, I think, especially for, you know, pulmonary critical care folks. You know, a lot of this is kind of new and investing into POCUS and right. um, ECHO, but this is this is great congestion. I think it's overlooked. I was just going to ask, do you um, see this kind of obviating the need for Swangans catheters in the ICUs for kind of our general um, medical ICU patients? You know, I know you had that patient that had the suggestion of elevated, you know, left ventricular and diastolic pressure, you know, you did the SWAN and you kind of confirmed that was falsely, you know, elevated from the outside. Um, I mean, do you think that's something that we should be doing, you know, doing some of this like VEXIS type scoring, looking for congestion, then either confirming or refuting with a SWAN, or is that just kind of a very rare type situation? So, and then yeah. my second question was, how often are you reevaluating these patients after set interventions? Are you going back and doing the, you know, the same type of ultrasounds serially? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So for your first question, excellent question. So, you know, I, I manage a lot of patients who have devices and, and a lot of patients who are post-op. So a lot of times they'll have their Swan-Gans catheter. Uh, now to answer your question in the medical ICU, I absolutely believe if you truly can get good imaging and you understand your hepatic and your portal vein, 
for the most part, you can obviate the need of swan gans catheter. Obviously, I still am a proponent of using the swan gans when it's not clear. Um, I still I think this is a skill set that's been lost over time and can be very helpful in patients who have a mixed picture. But we always, you know, um, and and with with my residents, with my fellows, we always before they're uh, taken off to the cath lab, I tell them do a full exam and you tell me what you think their filling pressures are. And nine times out of ten, they'll get it right because they're doing it the right way. For your second question, how, how many times are you coming back and reevaluating? Multiple times. Um, it not only tells you whether you're headed on the right pathway, because remember your vascular congestion can change before you start to see changes in your x-ray or you start to see changes in your lower extremities. And so I actually advocate to come back Another good thing to do is because if you keep on re-examining your patient, you keep on getting better and better. And when you start to correlate pathology with it, now you start to see the nuances. So yes, to answer your question, I think this is, this is very doable for pulmonary critical care fellows. Um, we do a, work, a workshop where we go through congestion parameters. Within the next day, I see people, I am amazed at what they're able to do. Um, I think what's most important is interpreting what it means. Getting these uh, waveforms is one thing, understanding what it means and then instituting therapies thereafter, I think is a more important thing. There's a difficult situation that most of the, uh, the, the fellows are gonna be at is that you will be doing this and your attendings or your faculty may not be familiar with it. So this is where the difficulty comes to play is that who is going to be there to guide you and to show you these things? Um, because this is, in all for all intents and purposes, more advanced. And again, only a select few people are actually doing it consistently in their institutions. Thank you. Welcome. We uh, have a question in the chat from Aditya. Um, he's uh, inquiring if there are any studies comparing Doppler strategies with the passive leg raise test. Okay, so you bring up the passive leg raise, but this is a concept that we need to move away from. Why are you doing the passive leg raise? You're doing it to show whether the patient's volume responsive. In other words, you want to give this patient more fluid, but this is not what I'm, 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 I'm advocating for. You're not talking about trying to give a patient more fluid. You're looking at whether they're tolerant. In other words, whether they're fluid tolerant. So in this case, when you're scanning the patient and you see that the patient has completely normal hepatic veins, completely normal portal veins, nothing to suggest congestion, when you're going to give them that fluid, you'll say, you know what, I think this patient can tolerate the fluid that I'm going to give them. Once you start to see changes in the hepatic waveform, you're going to actually revert to a more decongestive mode. You want to remove the fluid. Now, there are people who've actually correlated this to fluid responsiveness, but I think there's a distinct difference between it. But yes, a patient is going to be more fluid responsive when you have normal waveforms, as opposed to someone who has congested waveforms who will likely be uh, likely not respond to fluid and increase their stroke volume. And uh, we have a follow-up question from Mark. Um, do you have any, uh, are you aware of any ongoing studies uh, that are looking uh, at ways in which this can impact patient-oriented outcomes like um, the length of ventilator support, IC length of stay, uh, and things of that nature? Absolutely. You know, there's a lot of places that are actually doing it. We're doing it as well, looking at all ICU comers. Uh, we want to see whether a, uh, a, a protocol driven, a, a, a Doppler protocol driven strategy will actually decrease, for example, uh, uh, ventilator days, will decrease length of stay, et cetera. If you're able to obtain instantaneous uh, you know, uh, uh, understanding of the right side of the heart and you're able to remove fluid quickly, we suspect that you will likely have patients move out of the unit more. But again, I do agree. This is all physiological. It makes sense, but it needs to make a difference in patient-centered outcomes for it to be taken by, uh, by, by the whole uh, society of, of critical care. Uh, and uh, I have a question for um, you know patients with you know chronic artery failure, pulmonary hypertension, who have uh, you know chronic uh, chronic elevated pressures. Can you still um, lean on this to help guide you uh, in terms of what their volume status might be? 
Excellent question. So the problem with someone, it's very similar to can you lean on the IVC or can you lean on the RV, right? So it will be reflective of higher pressures. But this is where the hepatic vein, for example, uh, will show you flow reversal, for example, in a patient of severe TR, RV dysfunction, high PA pressures. But this is where you're going to use another vascular bed. And this is where the portal vein comes into play. You can have someone who has complete flow reversal in their hepatics, and then when you look at their portal vein, it is flat. Those are the patients that I will be very wary of diuresing, even though their PA pressures are very high and their central venous pressure is high. Why? Because they're very preload dependent. You start to diurese, you then notice the patient goes into AKI very quickly and RV failure. Um, and so another example I always give, this actually happened yesterday. We had a guy who had a late presenting STEMI, poor LV function, has an impella on the left side of the heart that's decompressing the left side of the heart, has a completely normal RV. Uh, when you look at the hepatic veins, because the tricuspid valve is competent and the RV is, and remember the left side of the heart is being decompressed, the hepatic veins look completely normal. When you look at the patient's portal vein, it's completely pulsatile. This flanknic circulation is overloaded, but you don't see that in the hepatic veins because the hepatic veins reflect the right heart apparatus that's being decongested. And so we actually aggressively diuresis this patient who had a creatinine of five. And it went, even though this, uh, the swan gans number looked okay, we aggressively diuresis with the Bumex strip and within three days had a normal creatinine. So to answer that question, what do I lean on? I lean on the portal vein or the interrenal venous Doppler to tell me information about diuresis unlike the hepatic vein that tells me more about the right heart apparatus, but can also tell me about congestion as well. Thank you. Um, any questions from the conference room? Well, uh, Dr. Sanusi, thank you so much for your talk today. We really enjoyed it. And, um, thank you. And 